get underway. So, uh, welcome to today's webinar. We're going to be uh, talking about um, Flash Steam and uh, and its various incarnations, um, and how it becomes relevant and important for for our Steam systems, how we use Steam, and what we need to look at. So. Uh, just as a bit of an overview, I'm going to start with a few definitions um, and explanations. Um, then we're going to look at how to actually calculate what your flash steam loading may be. Um, then we're going to look at applications and what this actually means in terms of, uh, for those of you that have got a steam system that you're worrying about, um, the things that you need to be thinking about and, and giving good consideration to. Um, we're going to talk specifically about flash tanks for both modulating and non-modulating systems and there's a couple of fundamental key differences from a best practice point of view in terms of how you need to approach these. And then we'll uh, talk uh, briefly about some scenarios. Okay, so first up, um, it's important that we understand the nature of steam. Now, there's different forms of steam. Some of you will be uh, familiar with these terms. But we're going to talk a little bit more in detail today about how this actually impacts on us. And so the uh, first form, obviously, is superheated steam, which is traditionally um, what you'll find in a uh, boiler system in a power plant and the like. Um, and this is where your steam is heated to a temperature well above the saturation temperature, i.e., so for example, if you've got your kettle in the kitchen at home, which is at atmospheric pressure, um, if you've uh, boiled the, uh, the the kettle, it's going to be sort of 100 degrees. Um, now, to superheat the steam that was coming off your kettle, um, you would then need to add additional heat to raise that to sort of say 120, 130 degrees, in which case your, your superheat would be 20 degrees over 100 degrees, so you would call that 20 degrees superheat. Um, so obviously superheat, we normally talk in terms of how many degrees of temperature over and above the saturation temperature um, for the uh, pressure that the steam is at. Now most process heat applications, we tend to use saturated steam. This is where steam is either at or extremely close to um, the saturation temperature, i.e. right where the steam is ready to condense. So in most applications you might have one or two degrees of superheat in your steam distribution main, but obviously with thermal losses you'll end up, um, as you get close to your end point of use, where that steam is close to being saturated, um, depending on how good your insulation is and how much superheat you're actually running. Now, once we've used our steam, we're going to end up with condensate and typically that condensate in a heat exchanger or upstream of a team, steam trap um, is going to be what we refer to as saturated condensate. So this means the condensate, like the saturated steam, is at the, uh, the, the temperature for the, uh, at which the steam turns to vapour or conversely the vapour then turns back to a liquid phase, i.e. is condensed. Now, what will happen, of course, is when you take that saturated condensate, if that goes across a pressure drop, um, you will have a drop in pressure, and as a result of that, some of that condensate is going to flash off to form what we refer to as flash steam. Now, some applications, you will actually deliberately subcool that condensate below the saturation temperature, which in most instances is going to mean that you won't have steam flashing off, but that does actually depend on pressures and everything else, and we'll go through some examples of that later today. So remembering that when we have steam, it's a uh, complex two-phase system, and we have both a liquid and a vapour phase, and that applies both when we have steam in our steam lines and also condensate in our condensate lines. Now, I guess with that in mind, I just want to re-emphasise this point it's very important to recognise that condensate is not just boiler feed water. Condensate's a two-phase mixture, typically of a liquid and vapour phase. Now, might sound pedantic, but as we do some examples today, you'll uh, see just how significant that vapour phase and condensate can be, i.e. our flash steam. Now, what's also worth noting here today, although the numbers will be different, the same principles apply to other 
cycles and other working fluids, for example, refrigeration cycles, where the working fluid will be something other than water. Um, organic Rankine systems and the like, all of these uh, principles apply, obviously with different thermodynamic properties and tables. Now, when you have a high pressure condensate, so typically you might have a, uh, a high pressure heater, might be 20 bar, 40 bar, okay, and then that's coming out, um, so you've got high pressure condensate, you've condensed the steam at that high pressure, and now of course that steam or condensate is going to go through either some sort of typically uh, steam trap or orifice plate or some other discharge, um, which will generally have a lower pressure. When we lower the pressure, there is an adiabatic or, or conservation of uh, enthalpy where the energy has to be conserved. Now what happens of course at the lower pressure, we have a lower saturation temperature, which means the uh, sensible heat contained in the uh, solution has dropped and so that additional heat is, uh, is, is basically uh, given up and what that does is that heat is then used to vaporise some of that um, condensate so it turns it into flash steam. So remembering that in our enthalpy equation, the enthalpy of our fluid at any time is a, is a summation of our enthalpy of the actual fluid itself at the temperature that it's at, plus whatever enthalpy you've then got to uh, vaporise that, uh, that fluid, so that's your latent heat, and then you might have a superheat component. Now the key point to remember here is that our enthalpy of our compressed fluid is going to decrease as our pressure decreases, i.e. decreases with temperature. And what is also worth noting is our latent heat vaporisation, or HFG, is also going to increase as pressure is decreased, which is one of the quirks of the steam tables. Okay, so let's look at a uh, basic calculation. If we've got a, uh, a uh, condensate that's crossing over a pressure drop, we can actually calculate how much, um, how much that condensate is going to flash. And the way we do that is our percentage by weight of our flash steam is going to be the difference between the two enthalpies of the compressed liquids, obviously at the high pressure and the low pressure, i.e. high temperature, low temperature, divided by the amount of energy required to turn that liquid back into a vapour, so the latent enthalpy of vaporisation. Okay, so what does that actually look like? So if we go to a flash team table and we, I've just highlighted to keep things simple here, our 0 bar and 40 bar um, lines. So you'll notice that at 0 bar our saturation temperature is 100 degrees and for 40 bar steam it's 250, let's call it 252 degrees. Now you'll see our HF or our uh, enthalpy of the compressed liquid at that temperature at zero degrees is 419 kilojoules per kilogram and at 40 bar it's 1094, nearly 1095. So it's quite a big difference but as you can see there's 150 degrees of extra temperature. Now our HFG, we only need to worry about that at our low pressure because at the low pressure at zero bar, it's being vented to atmosphere, that's the amount of energy required to vaporise one kilogram of condensate. So it's going to take 2,257 kilojoules to vaporise one kilogram of condensate. So we punch those numbers in, so we've got our 1095 minus our 419 divided by our 2257. And so in that situation or application, <coughs> excuse me, 29.9%, so effectively 30% of that condensate will flash back into atmospheric pressure steam. So if this was occurring in a flash tank or our condensate line, 30% of our condensate load is going to be in a steam phase looking to uh, find a home or, or basically uh, there's, a, there's a huge amount of uh, energy there that needs to go somewhere. And uh, so when we look at this in a little bit more detail, 
what we now want to do is we'll understand well what actually happens as that condensate flashes off. And so what we want to do is we want to repeat that same calculation but look at it in terms of volume. So I've highlighted, you'll see on the right there up here in yellow, the specific volume of the steam <coughs> is 1.673 cubic metres per kilogram. Whereas for the liquid phase, you can see it's substantially less at uh, barely one litre as opposed to one cubic metre per kilogram. And so what happens is, is if we take our, our weight percentage, for every kilogram we've actually got 299 grams of flash steam, and so we then multiply that by our 1.673, and so we have half a cubic metre of flash steam, and then if we calculate our volume of our condensate, obviously it's 701 grams for every kilogram. Okay, multiply that by our, our uh, one litre per kilogram. You've then got uh, 0.7 of a litre, so 700 mils or 0 0.0007 cubic metres of condensate. And so what you can see there, when you put this into percentage terms, our 30% flash steam actually becomes 99.85% by volume. In other words, effectively, in our pipeline or our condensate line downstream of where the steam is flashed off, our only consideration really needs to be ensuring that we've got somewhere for that flash steam to go. Um, if we don't, then obviously you get a build up in pressure and there's all sorts of water hammer issues and other damage to infrastructure that can be caused. So with this in mind, when we look at our steam system, what we need to think very carefully about is where do we have superheated steam, if at all any, where is our saturated steam and where is our condensate, both our uh, saturated condensate, therefore when that drops across a pressure drop, we're going to have flash steam, and then where is our subcooled condensate. So if you look here in this system, you'll notice that obviously red is our steam, blue is our liquid phase condensate, and then you'll notice that after all of our traps, we are showing a vapour phase, and so it's very important that we allow somewhere after those traps for that vapour phase to expand, our flash steam to expand, so that we don't get a build up of pressure. And so you'll notice that in each of these lines coming down here we have flash steam, and obviously that's looking for somewhere to go, and so on our condensate return tank down here before our boiler feed water, we haven't drawn in deaerators and the like, but we are going to have a substantial flash steam loading that needs to uh, vent. Now if it's just being vented outside then that can become a, a safety hazard, obviously also a loss of energy. Um, so ideally in this situation you would look to have some sort of vent condenser or uh, look at running that through your uh, boiler makeup feed water for example to uh, recover that heat. But uh, we'll look a little later on in terms of what this sort of costs in terms of um, energy savings. So when we calculate our flash steam, so we've gone through those examples um, where we did the equation uh, previously. So what we want to do now is if we take our 40 bar calculation, which we've already done, you can see there that our percent of flash is nearly 30%. When we drop to a 28 bar system, discharging to zero bar or to atmospheric, that percentage drops to 25, 26%. 10 bar at 16% and 1 bar at 3.8%. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, what I want to do is just to re-emphasize this point. If we redo our volume calculation uh, based on our 1 bar steam flashing off to ambient, just to atmosphere, so we're talking real low pressure steam here, you can see that by weight it's very minuscule. It's you know, barely worth worrying about, you might think, but when we do our volume calculation, you'll note that we're still effectively 98.5% by volume is our flash steam. So our condensate load, even at these low pressures, is the least of our worries in terms of sizing pipe work and such. So if we, re we can rework these numbers at a higher 
um, discharge pressure, so we can raise that to six bar as opposed to our zero bar. And so if we take our 40 bar, we're now down at 19%, 28 bars at 14.6% and our 10 bars at 4%. Now, as you can appreciate, obviously they're all by mass. If you do a by volume calculation, again, you're gonna be still in the very high uh, 90 uh, percentile of, uh, of, of how much uh, how much of your condensate line or flash steam is taking up of your condensate line. So when we put this into tabular form, you can see there on the left hand side we've got a range of pressures um, and obviously you've got the properties that you can see in the thermodynamic tables and you can do the math to save you the trouble. Here's a quick cheat sheet that you can refer to. And so if you're discharging to atmospheric, you can see that we can 3.8% uh, at one bar, We've got our 29% or 30% at 40 bar. You just see that when you get up to 120 bar, we get sort of substantial pressures. Now, generally, you're not going to be doing that, um, but if you did, you can see how the numbers really start to stack up. And even still at the six bar discharge, you've still got some substantial percentages, especially when you do the calculation by volume. Okay, so, uh, if we now start to think about, well, what does this then mean? Okay, so we want to start talking about some applications. So if we look at steam traps, we're going to look at orifice plates, control valves, condensate return lines, heat exchangers, and flash tanks. Okay, so if we look at steam traps, first of all, there's some key data that we probably need to concern ourselves with. And the first thing is, okay, well, what is our actual steam pressure? And then, of course, what's the pressure of our condensate line, i.e., our, our steam trap's going to discharge into some sort of condensate system. Um, now that system is going to have some back pressure on it as opposed to it being discharged, just venting to atmosphere. And so that's going to then come back up and provide some back pressure on your steam trap. And that pressure is actually going to dictate how much um, flash steam we're going to generate on the discharge side of the steam trap. The other key thing to think about is your condensate header location. Um, and then ultimately at some point in the life of that trap, you probably want to be thinking about when that trap starts to fail or starts to leak, what's the consequence going to be? So when the trap starts leaking, you're not only going to have uh, saturated condensate, you could potentially have some live steam from the uh, process side. So your, your pressures are going to go up. So your flash steam loading in your line is going to go up. Okay, so that's going to have an impact in terms of the performance and capacity of your condensate system. Um, and so as a VIA minimum, your condensate system needs to be sized based on your worst case scenario flash loading, um, not your condensate. Um, where this is particularly relevant, if you have a system which has been designed based on subcooled condensate, then you are going to virtually guarantee that that line will be undersized the minute you have any flash steam or live steam leaking into that system. So I've seen countless examples up and down the country, both here and overseas, where this can become a problem. People make the assumption that it's all going to be subcooled, therefore it's all okay, we can ignore flash steam. But what you want to think about is, well, what are my modes of failure and what's my likelihood of that happening at some point, and at some point you can virtually guarantee that trap will fail, um, in which case you need to be prepared for it. Now, you might have orifice plates instead of steam traps. So it's a similar principle is still going to apply. You've still got an upstream pressure and a downstream pressure. You'll have a pressure differential, and uh, obviously if you're going to pass condensate through that orifice plate, you will have a flash steam being generated. In addition to that, of course, you may well also have some live steam because the orifice plate is only restricting flow, not actually trapping the steam. Okay, and so you probably need to be a little bit more conservative on the sizing of your pipework downstream from your orifice plates. If these are being used in a heat exchanger, then hopefully you've got the uh, the design of the front part of your heat exchanger right so that that uh, low pressure section where you've been through an orifice plate is, is going to make sure that your your steam is being condensed and then subcooled so you've got subcooled condensate coming out the back end. 
Um, so once again, when you're doing this, you've got to be very careful in terms of how you're going to control the system and make sure that you get your orifice plates tuned so that they're the correct size for the steam load. Now where you may come unstuck with this sort of system if you're not careful is obviously if you have a high dynamic load range on the, uh, on the system in terms of the duty, your steam loads might vary which means obviously your steam and condensate flow through the system will vary which means your orifice plate which is a fixed device is going to change how it can uh, respond to the load across it so the flows through it will change which is then going to be coupled to the performance of the heater so you need to be very careful on a dynamic duty that uh, your orifice plates are sized to handle it or you've got some other means of control uh, in place. Now control valves actually uh, create a very interesting scenario in terms of our steam system and uh, the first thing there I want you to think about is we're obviously going to have an upstream pressure but recognise that by virtue of how they're operating we're going to have some pressure differential across the valve. Now what we want to think about here there's a couple of scenarios that I'd like to talk through this morning. The first one is, is what happens if we haven't successfully removed condensate upstream of the control valve. So this might be where we have uh, drip legs that are clogged and are not, uh, so you might have a steam trap that's uh, um, failed closed and so you can't drain condensate out of your distribution line if it's a real cold day. You might have a bit more uh, condensate being generated because the steam is being slightly uh, cooled along its way. If you don't remove that condensate upstream of the control valve, um, that condensate is going to be saturated, it will be at the same temperature as the steam. When that condensate hits the pressure drop going across the control valve, a certain percentage of that condensate is going to flash. When that flashes, that's actually quite an explosive process, and we'll, we'll look at the change in volume that you've already seen, but we'll look at this in a bit more detail later. Um, and so of course that is going to destroy very quickly your valve seat. And so there's a couple of things to think about here in terms of our uh, control valve. Um, we need to be careful that our pipe is sized correctly so that our flow rates aren't too high. We also need to remove our condensate. If we don't remove our condensate, then we run the risk of damaging our valves very, very quickly. Now there are a lot of places that they they sort of accept this and it's sort of an annual maintenance line item uh, in an annual shut where these valves just all get re-kitted. There are reticulated steam systems in the world. Uh, New York City is a really good example. It's one of the biggest reticulated steam systems in the world. It's only used for you know so many months a year. What's interesting is they have control valves that are still operating 20, 30 years on and they've not needed to be re-kitted because they've been installed correctly, they've been sized correctly, um, they, they don't need to do anything because the valve seat's protected. Um, the valve works fine because there's no condensate being flashed across the valve seat. If you get the design right and you get the maintenance of the system right, you, you can have these, these assets last substantially longer. And for those of you out there that uh, aware of how much these control valves can be worth in terms of cost to replace. Um, you know, these are substantially uh, expensive pieces of kit. Even on a large site, it's not uncommon to have sort of a ten, twenty thousand dollar valve. Um, and and obviously, the cost of re-kitting that valve is still a relatively expensive exercise um, these days with your. Uh, uh, health and safety requirements to uh, take a, a valve out of commission to be able to uh, do the work that you need, it becomes an expensive exercise. So you can start to do the math aside from energy savings, there's substantial maintenance savings to be, uh, to be had here. Now there's another scenario that I want to talk you through and that's on a startup cycle. So if we consider we've got a 40 bar heat exchanger, um, when that heat exchanger is being started up, the pressure on the downstream side of the control valve is no longer 40 bar. On startup, it might be one, two, three bar, and take some while to uh, to slowly heat those coils up. 
Now, of course, what that means is, is if you've got, even if you've got your uh, steam, you've removed your condensate upstream of the valve, and so that's all great, what will actually happen is that steam on the downstream side of the uh, control valve is going to be superheated, because obviously when you drop the pressure, there's a lot less energy required for that steam to be at that pressure, and so where does that energy go? It goes into the steam becoming superheated. Now, where of course this becomes an issue is when you have any cold or subcooled condensate left in the bottom of these coils. That superheated steam has got a whole lot of surplus energy in it um, before that even begins to condense, and that comes in contact with that subcooled condensate, and very quickly that condensate, even though it's cold, is going to start to flash, and when that flashes, that will be explosive. So for those of you that have got air heaters um, like this and on startup, they make a whole lot of noise. That's typically one of the first things you want to be looking for is a little bit of subcooled condensate left in the bottom of that heater. And that's the, the fresh superheated steam coming into the heater, coming in contact and literally exploding or expanding that, that condensate into a rather much larger volume of steam. So to give you an idea of scale, just to remind you that one milliliter of condensate is going to flash to 1.6 liters of flash steam. So it's an over 1600 times expansion in volume and it happens instantly. And so on startup, absolutely critical um, that we, we don't have any subcooled condensate sitting in the bottom of these coils, that that is actually drained. So it's something else to think about in terms of uh, of, of your design of your system. It's not a pipe sizing issue, it's one of not having liquid where it shouldn't be and the consequences of that happening. What you find is very quickly if you've got a system like this is you leave it long enough, um, once that's all worked through, the stuff gets flashed off and it all disappears and eventually after a few minutes the noise dies away. The problem is, is that damage is all being done on startup every time that you start your system up. And so the cumulative damage over time is going to add up and this is where you'll start to have failures. And in most instances, those failures are going to be your low pressure sections of your heating coils, not your high pressure section. Um, and so it becomes very, very important. but. Um, quite useful in terms of when if you're sitting there and you've got a coil that you've got some uh, failures occurring, this is your, probably your number one culprit to look to target. Okay, so if we move on from our, um, our heaters now to look at our condensate return system. So in our condensate return system, obviously the key thing that we need to look at still is our pressure. So obviously you've got your upsteam steam pressure, but then you're going to have your condensate return pressure. And the first critical question to ask yourselves is, is our condensate going to be gravity fed? Is it going to be pumped or is it a bit of both? Are you actually relying on back pressure to move that condensate? Now, if you're relying on that back pressure, you need to be very careful that uh, we handle the, uh, the back pressures appropriately, especially when you've got both your vapor phase, i.e. any flash that you have in the system, as well as your condensate. Now if you're pumping obviously the condensate, ideally you want that condensate to be at least partially subcooled, so you don't have issues at the uh, intake to the pump, um, so you need to be careful there. The other thing you need to be thinking about in terms of your condensate load, is it fixed or is it going to be modulating? If it's modulating, you need to be very careful about your condensate tank, you don't want to be controlling the pressure of your uh, you condensate tank if it means that that's going to then provide a feedback loop or a coupled loop which could potentially result in an unstable um, coupling of the control loop of your device or your process. So you need to be very careful that you decouple that by venting your condensate tank. Now if you're venting your condensate tank, any flash steam coming off that tank probably wants to be recovered, otherwise that's going to be an energy loss and on a lot of sites that can add up very, very quickly. So with your heat exchangers feeding into your condensate system, you've got to understand is my load modulating or non-modulating, i.e. a fixed load. Um, you can change your uh, re condensate return temperature, are you going to return it hot, are you going to return it cold, are you going to subcool it, 
Um, can I use my flash steam? Can I actually use the heat from my condensate? Um, one of the uh, things that we're seeing more and more nowadays from an energy saving point of view is you've got a condensate that might be at 80 or 90 degrees and then you're also piping in 80 degree hot water into the plant. Now when you want to put a condensing economizer on your boiler for example, it's really helpful to have a nice cold sink over at the boiler and a really good one is your boiler return water i.e. your return condensate or your boiler makeup water. So one of the sensible things to look at is can I actually take my condensate and actually use it for other heating duty to displace hot water which is probably otherwise going to be generated from my boiler or indirectly by steam and reduce that uh, heating load on my utility system. Um, so yeah, it's just thinking through how else I can use energy that's there. Um, obviously the advantage of subcooling or condensate in the factory is if you're then looking to pump it, um, you've got no problems in terms of your flash steam in that line, it's all going to be nicely subcooled, makes pumping it that much easier and so it reduces your risks um, and exposure to your condensate return system. And so I guess this becomes important, I guess, to, uh, I guess the one caveat or thing to mine or caution, I guess, is with your steam supply, if your boiler is being operated by yourself, then you might have the ability to do this, whereas if you're buying your steam through the fence, i.e. you're just paying a third party to provide you with the steam, you will probably be contracted to return a certain percentage of condensate and for that condensate to be at a certain temperature. And so I guess the question still remains, it may be beneficial working with the third party that's supplying your steam to renegotiate your contract and, and help them to get some efficiencies on their end in terms of the efficiency of their system. Obviously if they're running a boiler and their boiler stacks at 160 degrees, um, their efficiency is only going to be so good um, depending on what they're using to generate the steam. Now obviously if they can drop that stack temperature to sort of say 50 or 60 degrees with a condensing economizer, that's all fuel saving in terms of improving the efficiency of their boiler. So whether it's your boiler or a third party's boiler, it's certainly room to negotiate and, and look at these things in detail. Now just coming back in terms of our, our heat exchanges and our uh, flash tanks that we might use to recover our flash steam. Obviously we want to do this before we return it to the boiler. For a non-modulating load we can control the pressure of these systems. And so we've got two things, we can recover the flash stream at pressure or alternately we can just return that condensate to our boiler at high pressure and not generate the flash steam in the first case. So depending on certain applications it might actually be suited to just a high pressure condensate return um, and so therefore you, you don't deal with any of the condensate of flash tanks and all the rest of it. However, if you, uh, if you want to recover your flash and use it because your boiler is not set up to have a high pressure return, then you want to look at how you can utilise that steam. Now if we do that, obviously we need to have a condensate tank where we can separate out the flash from the condensate okay, to ensure that that energy is not lost. Now if we just vent the flash steam, then that's going to be lost energy. So obviously our focus should be on recovering the flash steam and finding an appropriate place to use it. Now I'll, uh, I'll defer to the webinars here at this point that uh, my colleagues Tim and Martin have done in terms of uh, heat recovery and uh, heat integration of your system. This is where obviously the key point to all of this is making sure that you've identified the correct sources and sinks for your integration. Now assuming you've done that then obviously we want to look to recover that flash steam and utilise it. Now for a modulating load, i.e. on a temperature controlled heat exchanger, the, uh, the steam usage may modulate based on the uh, dynamics of the system. Now you could have a relatively stable system where that modulation is very modest and minor and so you might almost be able to get away with a fixed system. However, where you've got a dynamic variation in your load, you need to be very, very careful. Okay, all condensate lines on these types of systems must be vented or recovered to a flash steam tank which is then vented and those condensate lines should obviously be sized for the flash steam loading. Now when we get to the tank, obviously on the vent of that tank we can either 
have that flash team then go into a uh, a, a non uh, back pressure, i.e. discharging to ambient uh, heating coil. So you could have a uh, a final uh, flash tank coil on your heater somewhere, or flash steam uh, coil, sorry, on your on your heat exchanger where you condense that flash steam, which is then discharged uh, to to drain an atmosphere, or you can then utilise it elsewhere, or you may need to have a vent condenser on your flash tank that then is obviously generating hot water or some other uh, heating utility. So it's back to, once again to getting good alignment between this as a source and obviously appropriately sized um, sinks both in terms of the amount of heat and the temperature that you need that heat at. Now obviously the lower the steam pressure that you use at the front end is going to reduce the amount of flash steam that you generate. Um, now obviously the uh, vent condenser that we're talking about, just a few examples down the bottom there, so your external heat exchanger to, to utilise that could be heating air, water or other process streams. Now what we want to do is just take a few minutes to go through a really useful example here. So okay, so I've got a flash tank that I'm looking to, uh, to install. How do we go about sizing that flash tank? So what we want to do first of all is we need to calculate the condensate loading, then we can calculate the flash steam loading based on some pressures. Now if you're in a system where that pressure might float up and down a little bit, you can do a bit of a sensitivity analysis and rerun these calculations for multiple pressures. Okay, now as a rough rule of thumb or as a guide in terms of best practice, your flash tank should be sized to have a volume for the steam, the flash steam, to be equivalent to one to two seconds of capacity. So you want your flash steam to have a resonance time in your tank of a couple of seconds. Okay, whereas your condensate in that flash tank should be sized for a minimum of five minutes capacity. Bearing in mind as a rough rule of thumb, if you've got flash steam in a line, you don't want that flash steam going at 15 metres a second or more, 20 max. If it's a steam line, um, it can be 30, condensate two. And based on our calculation that we did earlier, you will appreciate that where you've got flash steam and condensate together in a line coming off a trap or some other process, you ultimately end up sizing that line for the flash steam and then the condensate will be fine. Okay, so if we look at flash tank sizing, so we can take a 10 tonne an hour steam duty at 40 bar, flashing to 6 bar. So our condensate load is obviously going to be 10 tonnes an hour. So we're going to then calculate our flash steam loading. So how do we do that? Well, just as a refresher, we're going to go to our steam tables. So you'll look here, first of all, we've got our 40 bar. So there's our um, enthalpy of the uh, condensate that's saturated at 40 bar. Okay, our flash steam loading, remember, is 19.2%. Okay, our enthalpy at 6 bar, and then obviously our latent heat vaporisation is 2700 kilojoules per kilogram at 6 bar. So what does that mean? So condensate loads 10 ton an hour. We know that our flash steam percentage is 19.2%. So translation of our 10 tonnes of steam, 1.92 tonnes is flashed off into flash steam at 6 bar, 0 0.53 kilograms a second. So the mass of steam coming into our flash tank, um, we're going to times that by two seconds, so that's going to be just over a kilogram. We want to be able to size our flash tank to hold a kilogram of flash steam. So the volume of steam, well we need the specific volume. So we go back to the steam tables and you'll see that at 6 bar, we come across here, so our specific volume of steam at 6 bar is 0.272 cubic metres per kilogram, or 272 litres per kilogram if you like. And so we do that calculation, our volume of steam, just over one kilogram, so we get 290 litres. So our flash tank needs 290 litres of volume for the flash steam section. Now we need to then look at how much condensate we need. And so you'll see that our condensate load is obviously our eight tonnes, or just over eight tonnes an hour, or 2.24 kgs a second. Remembering that we want five minutes capacity, so we take our 2.2 kgs, times that by 60, then 5. So we get 673 kgs 
of uh, condensate. Now without splitting hairs, we're talking 673 litres. So, I apologise. So if we go back, we've got 673 litres for the condensate and another 300 litres, if you like. And so in simple terms, what you're looking at here is probably a cubic metre flash tank. But what you need to be mindful of is that the bottom two thirds of that tank is condensate and the top third is flash steam. And so with that in mind, you need to be very careful where you put your intake pipe because obviously you want that intake pipe above where the water level is. I, I apologise, I should have a picture in here and I don't to, to indicate that. But obviously you will have your condensate coming off the bottom of the tank, your flash team will come off the top and your, your mixed phase inlet pipe will come into the side of the tank, but you need to make sure based on this calculation that our intake light pipe needs to be in the top third of that tank to enable the condensate to fall out and for the flash team to come off the top. It's very important that your intake pipe is located correctly so that you don't end up percolating your flash team through your condensate. Now, if you want to look at the, uh, the sizing of your pipe coming into the flash tank, so this is where you've got your flash team and condensate together, you'll notice that we've got our uh, volume of steam um, coming through. Um, we're going to times that by the specific volume, so we've got so many cubic metres a second. So you work out your minimum area based on our 15 metres a second, which gives us a minimum diameter of 111 millimetres. So you're going to push the limit, you could probably go with a 4 inch or 100 mil line or ideally a 5 or probably a 6 inch line. So this is where if you've got that much of a condensate or flash steam loading upstream here between where your steam traps or your, your condensate header might be, you can see that ideally that line needs to actually be quite large. Now obviously your steam line, your flash steam line out of your condensate tank or your flash tank can be smaller because you can then crank up once it's been separated, that steam velocity can probably go up to 25, 30 metres a second without too many troubles. So we can uh, we could certainly drop below that in terms of uh, our, uh, our pipe diameter. So you'd probably get away with a sort of a 3 inch or 80 mil line as opposed to 100 mil line off the flash tank um, for just the flash team once it's separated. Now if we look at our condensate line off the bottom of that tank, so we can then look at we want to condensate, we can assume obviously we've separated out the flash steam, so we're looking for a V max of under 2 metres a second, ideally 1.5 would be great, so we can work out our volume, and so we can work out that flow rate, and so you'll see that based on that we're wanting a minimum diameter of 38 millimetres, so you're really right on the cusp of sort of a 1.5 or a 2 inch line. Now remember we uh, talked earlier that you want to be careful here to ensure that you can uh, have a system that's resilient if you have something upstream fail. And so this is where my advice for this sort of system, if you were designing this from scratch, would be to make that line bigger rather than smaller. The, the marginal capital cost of that line being two inch versus one and a half inch is going to be minimal in your overall cost of your system and so you're better off building that resilience in if you've got the opportunity to do so. Okay, so the key summary points for flash tank sizing is our condensate line here was one and a half to two inch, remembering I recommended that you'd probably want to go with your two inch or 50 mil line. Your, your incoming line with the flash tank condensate together probably wants to be a six inch line, once again to allow for the fact if you have a trap fail, then that loading's only going to increase. Obviously our condensate lines should be sized for the flash steam, not just the condensate loading. And shortcuts here at this point, you can guarantee they will result in premature failure of your equipment at some point. Um, now if your flash tank is non-modulating, you can have that flash tank at a controlled pressure. If it's on a modulating system, that flash tank must be vented and obviously to save energy, you want to be using a, uh, a vent condenser to recover that heat or to have that steam going through. So to give you an idea, just to touch on this because it is about energy and, and saving money, which is helps what helps pay for these things, 
if you take our 40 bar system, if we don't recover our flash going to zero bar, so 30% of our steam is effectively lost based on $30 a tonne on a 10 tonne an hour system for 8,000 hours a year, that represents a loss of $718,000 per annum. Now even if you go to just only six bar, so you've only got 19%, it's still nearly half a million dollars. So you can see you can pick your pressure there um, and you can see that those savings add up. Now you might think, oh that's okay, it all goes back to the boiler and so it sort of means I lose less energy at the boiler. Generally your condensate tank's going to be vented and if you're not recovering it at the boiler, that is all being lost. So as you look around your site um, and you see these various uh, flash steam plumes coming off your system, they all represent money being lost, energy being wasted, surplus or additional emissions that you could look to save and the, pay, the payback for doing so can be substantial as those numbers indicate. So as a summary to, to finish things off today, um, condensate is not water. It has two phases. You will generally, in most instances where you have condensate, you're going to have a vapour or flash steam phase as well as a liquid. Okay, whenever you are sizing condensate lines, it's very important that you look at the flash steam loading um, and not just the condensate. If you get the flash steam loading right, you can pretty well bank on being right for the liquid. And the only other caveat there is to always be mindful of the fact that you want to consider the scenario where you have a, a steam trap failing and having additional steam coming through your system and what that can do. So you want to ensure that your system has a little bit of resilience in it. Um, you must always have drip legs immediately upstream of your control valves to protect your control valves. So there's really good best practice guides. Um, available through various uh, commercial suppliers on the internet. Um, I don't want to use names, but uh, certain providers have really good uh, handbooks and, and all sorts of information. They're generally quite uh, forthcoming in sharing that and making that available. If you have specific questions, feel free to contact me and I can give you more of those details. Um, just a reminder, if you have a flash tank fitted to a modulating load, just to re-emphasise this point because we see it time and time again and it more often than not results in problems and failures. Never have a pressurised flash tank fitted to a modulating load. The question to ask yourself is does the whole load need to modulate? Do you need to modulate the high pressure section where your flash team loading is highest? Can you fix that and get your modulating load with a low pressure section where your flash steam load will be less? Um, if you've got a flash tank, make sure it's sized correctly. And as we pointed out brief, just, just a few minutes ago, especially making sure that your intake pipe is located at the correct height because based on your, your condensate load versus your flash steam load, there's going to be a natural water level in that tank and you want to make sure that your intake is above that water line. Okay, so modulating loads when they're fitted with a flash tank must be vented. Obviously if you do that, if you don't want to be losing money, you need to um, have a vent condenser for recovering that heat and then obviously have an appropriate sink to use that heat. Um, obviously your condensate tanks, same rules apply. You've got to think and ask yourself the key questions. Where does the flash team go and what is it costing me? How can I justify doing something about it? Okay, so that concludes our webinar. I'm happy to stay on the line and answer any questions that uh, anyone may have. Um, just a reminder, we've got webinars coming up in two weeks. Uh, you're back with me again, we're looking at fan system measurements and how to make a difference. Um, and then on the 29th, the end of this month, we've got uh, boiler corrosion and deposition failures with David Addison. Um, just a reminder there that we've got the registration links for the future webinars are at the website, energyefficiencynz.com under the webinar tab. And the past webinars are being posted uh, on the ECA Business YouTube channel. The link is there or you can just go to YouTube and punch in Eka Business and uh, if you want to make it really easy, I strongly suggest you simply subscribe 
to the Eka Business Channel, and then you'll get an email every time the uh, a webinar is added to the uh, channel, and so you'll be able to not miss any of the webinars. So you don't even have to think about it. You get an email, and the link's right there, and it makes it very, very easy. So uh, just a reminder once again, I'm happy to take questions for those of you that might have them, um, and just while we're waiting for those people that might be typing a question, just a reminder that if you're looking for some help from anything that we've talked about today in terms of uh, getting started or some advice or identifying projects, or it may be that today's prompted you to think, hey, we should be looking at this, you can either contact myself um, with my uh, email, you'll get that as a reminder email post the webinar today anyway, or you can also go to your Eka account manager or the Eka website, and like I said, you can uh, punch in to the various uh, uh, industry suppliers um, that have got a presence here in New Zealand. Um, there's quite a number of outfits there, so in the interest of being fair, I'm not going to mention anyone by name, but obviously you can uh, Google and uh, and your various steam supplies will come up and they've also got some useful resources that you can tap into. Um, yes, yeah, so I thank you very much for listening in. Like I said, the recording will be available in the next couple of days. I'll, uh, I'll hang around for a few more minutes in case any of you have questions. Um, otherwise, thank you very much for joining in today. We'll give you a couple of more minutes. We'll stay on the line, and um, otherwise, we'll uh, see you all next time. All right. We don't have any questions coming through, so if you. Uh,